so I actually would just want to start off like as most of these Q and A's start off and talk about uh, how this project came to be. I read an interview, Larry, that you had been sort of interested in the topic of climate change and global warming since you read some books in the 90s. And was this sort of a long fermenting idea of yours or? Well, the real reason is I made a movie called Wendigo and we filmed upstate and in the last scene all the snow melted and I got very bitter that I couldn't get this sort of white expanse in the, in the woods, which was the climax of the film. So I figured I had to make a movie in a m much chillier climate. So I thought about Alaska, and especially at the time, there was a lot of talk about drilling in Anwar, which is this very pristine area in the uh, northernmost part of Alaska. I've always had a sense of outrage and disappointment at our relationship to the natural goings on. and. Uh, and so my thinking of being in a snowy climate, and um, oddly enough, this was conceived of as a sequel to Wendigo, which makes no sense, except there's a little bit of a spook, spook show going on. So all of those things, that's how I usually end up working. I worked on this with my friend Robbie Lieber, and we, um, we just slowly massaged the story out of those components, but uh, I wanted a snowy landscape, and we did get one. And, and you shot this uh, in Iceland, correct? Yeah, we, we looked all over Alaska. It was an amazing trip going uh, up north and, and seeing this landscape and being, it was actually two days into the Iraq war, so we were at Prudhoe Bay where they drill for oil. It was just a very intense atmosphere. Uh, very privileged to be there. Very few people go up there, um, mostly environmentalists and oil guys, so funny marriage. Um, and. Uh, we toured all the way uh, into the Beaufort Sea. We drove our uh, skidoos out there. So it was a, a great thing. My producer um, financed this, this exploration trip. And actually, I came back and rewrote the script with Robbie because we had conceived of beautiful mountains and trees. And actually, the landscape is completely flat. So we couldn't find such a place. Uh, it was hard to shoot in Alaska. There wasn't a lot of uh, film savvy uh, crew. So we found Iceland, and they. They host a lot of movies, Hollywood films and others, and so they were very welcoming and they knew just how to handle a little picture like this in a very remote place. And uh, Ron and James, how did you sort of come to this project? Did Larry reach out directly or did you just come across the script? How was that casting process? I, I was the last person that they, at the end of the block that said yes. They'd run out of names and they finally came to mind. <laughs> Ron doesn't remember any of the projects we've done know. together. <laughs> I usually have time to brief him beforehand, but we, he just flew in. So thanks for being here, Ron. You need Can any you help answers. me with this? No. Yeah. <laughs> well, I do remember calling you. You were gallivanting somewhere in the other part of the world. Do you remember that? You were in like a nightclub or something. And I yes, I was doing. I was um, doing my hungry, lounge, right? my lounge act. <laughs> um, <laughs> called. Um, um, Leopard skins are us. <laughs> um, no, uh, this was where we met, though. Yes, this is how we met. I, uh, I'd seen Ron and we're in still Hellboy. Friends, remarkably. Yeah, amazingly. Uh, I'd seen Ron in Hellboy, and I was obsessed with casting him. And uh, I sent him the script. And then, by chance, this uh, meeting was scheduled such that I got him on the phone, and he was indeed in a nightclub somewhere in Malaysia or something. And and because he couldn't hear my side of the conversation, he thought I was brilliant. And I thought he was Stanley Kubrick. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so he said, "You're saying yeah. Larry." I, I kept hearing Stanley. <laughs> I said, "Shit, I'm in. I'm, I'm in." So it was very exciting, and uh, and James came, and uh, and I think. Ron, you showed up. Of course, I said, I want rehearsal, and we're all going to get to know each other. And you basically said, no. And you showed up the day of the shoot. And uh, I wish I'd told the story. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I think th my sort of last question before I kick it to the audience, I think uh, one of the things that strikes me most about this movie is the sense of overwhelming sadness that all of the characters sort of carry with them throughout the film. <laughs> Uh, you know, Ron, I think you, your character really internalizes, especially the loss of Maxwell, um, and, and sort of carries that through the bulk of the film. And 
James, your character is just sort of sad at the state of the world, I think. <laughs> uh, <laughs> can you talk about sort of how that, how that process was as actors to sort of embody this, this horror but maintain a really human center of, of sort of this deep melancholy? I feel like um, Ed was probably the loneliest, most um, damaged guy maybe I ever played. Um, and I feel as though um, the thing that he resented most about um, James's character, Hoffman, right? Yeah. Was that he was the embodiment of why I felt as lonely as I did because I was fighting this, I was fighting for my life, but in, in the setting where it was working for these uh, ex exploitation mongers, really. And it was having to talk myself into the justification of existing in a world like that. And, and um, I think there was a, a, a part of me, at least this, I'm not sure if this was in the script or if this was just something that I sensed in why you wanted to tell the story that, that this, this, was this, this was this great, unspoken, real internal struggle with this incredibly damaged human being who's being asked to carry the water for the oil company. Yeah. And then he comes butt up against this guy who is, regards himself as a, a steward for the planet and someone who is determined to not turn the other cheek or, you know, um, turn a blind eye or get paid off or so he's he, he 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 really irks me because he makes me feel even more lonely that um i'm reminded of how uh uh corrupt and insignificant you know you, that your character is heartbreaking i hadn't seen the picture since i don't know probably since it came out uh, it's been a long time uh, and it, it really broke my heart <coughs> what he goes through. And, you know, here's this guy, I guess in a way Hoffman's sort of the conscience of the film, but Pollock is sort of the heart, and in a way it's so sad because here's a pretty, you know, all intense person. He cares about his people. He seems to be a virtuous guy in a lot of ways, but he's become like a pimp for the oil company, and it's, it's heartbreaking. And everything that he's tried to, in every way that he's tried to do the right thing, it's, it's, it's turned out to be a very bitter outcome. It's heartbreaking. Yeah, it was fun to watch that. Uh, I think it's so great when uh, you show up, you're so exuberant, and you know you're just happy. You're a real cheerleader, and I wanted to create this dichotomy where uh, you could say it's, it's clearly a political film in the sense that it seems to be um, criticizing the oil company, but I wanted to make Ron uh, a really a human character that was was struggling and trapped and sort of a, a cog in the wheel and really just trying to problem solve and do you know really approach this with a robust I love he's always saying where's the positivity you know and it's yeah. just like it's a he's a real gung-ho it's kind of a lot of the qualities but I think we love he, about he America. brought such pathos to that yeah. to a character that have, could have been in the wrong hands played so ham-fisted and and uh, this is really emotional t for me yeah, to, to see it. To see. I would like to point out uh, part of my genius, um, <laughs> but uh, you notice I wear an earring. I got this ear pierced for this movie, and uh, most of my family thought it was just another one of my midlife crisis <laughs> moments, but which probably it was. But I had read this article about how sailors used to, you know, get their ear pierced. The, the reason why sailors always had one earring was because that's what was going to pay for their funeral. So that even if they died destitute and they had nothing left and no one left, there was this one way for them to, you know, to go to their um, great reward, you know, and have a semblance of order. And I thought that was like one of the most poignant dichotomies I, I'd ever seen, you know, because if, if there's any rough and tumble more way of going through life, it's a semen. Um, and, 
but that's his insurance policy. And, and, and Larry a asked me what it was. I said, well, it's just a little something that I need to know, that I want to know. Because I feel like Ed is going to die with no friends and no family and no money. And at least he's got the diamond earring that'll pay for his funeral. Yeah, it was fun. Ron showed up with that. And as I say, we were shooting in 10 minutes. And he said, uh, I got this earring. And I said, really? That's interesting. I didn't quite see that for the character. <laughs> OK, and action. <laughs> but I'm finally was, explaining it to him now in front of all you people. No, no, he did explain it a couple, a couple times. I'm still trying to figure it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Uh, I thought it was beautiful and, and sort of a fun little mystery for me as, uh, as the shoot unfolded. And I think at one point you might have revealed it over drinks. All right, so does anyone in the audience have a question? Yes, in the front here. The, the question was about the uh, references to Algernon Blackwood's Wendigo in the film, including the, uh, the name Defago on the uh, screen. There's other images, the burning feet, uh, that also are alluded to, I think, to the same, same yes. short story. If you read uh, Wendigo recently, you'll remember that the guy says, oh, my feet, my burning feet on fire. So that's uh, referenced in the film after the plane crash when, the, uh, when Motor's feet are on fire. So I'd actually made a movie called Wendigo and not really steeped myself in the, um, in the Blackwood story, which uh, I was familiar with, but I didn't, when I wrote that film, I wasn't thinking entirely about it. But then I revisited it, and I realized how much I enjoy the atmosphere that he creates, creates of this sort of unknowable dread. And there's always this confusion as to this otherness and, and our role in nature and, and so on. So yes, I'm a huge fan of his, the tone that he sets. And I was actively trying to, um, to reference that and, and, and seep myself in the very strange dread that he creates. Even more than Lovecraft, I always have to um, point out that Lovecraft said that Algernon Blackwood was the true master, which always tickles me, because he's less known, but um, they, they had similar. He loved the outdoors. He did love the outdoors, and he was an outdoorsman, and he would go on these kind of hikes. He was a... If you haven't read The Willows yet... Well, that's his greatest story. It's a gorgeous story. You well, you've named all three of my favorite of his stories. Those are them. Wendigo, The Willows, and The Glamour of the Snow. I recommend them. Very fun winter reading in particular. <laughs> have, have you seen this film the, uh, before tonight? Have I seen this yeah. film? No, this is the first time. Wow. <laughs> well, when I saw that name Defago, or Defago, I'm not sure how it should be pronounced. Defago, I in, say. In the, uh, yeah. in the computer. To answer your question, yeah. Said, this sounds like a Blackwood story to me. Yeah. And to specifically answer your question, yeah, I, I imagine that uh, Defago was the was the internet service, so it's an inside uh, joke, uh, and that's we had to build that, and that's and the, the name. Yes, they believe in trolls they too, yeah. and their Santa Claus is mean. Yeah, <laughs> Krampus. Uh, any other questions? Yes, in the middle there.
So the question was on how do you create empathy for a character who's going crazy and a character who's a son of a bitch? Ron relies on talent. I have to work very hard. <laughs> yep. Um, no, um, I, I, what, I mean, what you just, like, describes is everything that fascinates me about playing damaged people. I'm, there's something about um, damaged people that really, really kind of resonates deeply inside of me, especially when um, you can pinpoint the cost that they've paid that got them to that place. And so there's always this, if things had gone a little bit differently or if, if circumstances were, 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 were changed, you know, would that person have come out of uh, manifest him, himself in a way that is, um, what is it that he's, that he's covering up? And if you can, you know, always kind of keep it in a, a kind of deep and hidden place what he's covering up, but it's there, to me that's, that's fascinating. Um, you know, even in the playing of really, really despicable, dark people like serial killers and everything, you know, it's like, there's something that went wrong. And in, when you investigate that, if it's something that is universal and that there but for the grace of God could go any of us, you know, that's, that's what's fascinating to me. I always, um, when I have a so-called villain, I mean, I hardly think that Pollock is a villain, but he's clearly a making tough choices here that you might disagree with. In any case, I, I think that in directing and talking about the character and in writing it, uh, my agenda is, is always to find just what Ron's describing. You know, the, uh, th nobody sets out, gets up in the morning and says, I am a villain today. They think they have their motivations and it's more interesting to try to understand why they're behaving the way they are. So I, I like to come at it as a director from the sympathetic point of view and, and, and try to understand the character doesn't mean you're giving them a pass. They may be doing things that are despicable in the film, but uh, but you kind of want to understand that. That's going to be much more interesting than a, a, a one-sided, you know, one-dimensional character. But even the character you play in this film, as he dies a terrible burning death, your yeah. wallet flip, flips that open. That is the one one-dimensional character we yeah. do have, actually. <laughs> well, it, it's true, I did. Uh, I'm glad you saw that. It seemed very uh, dark this evening. But yes, the guy who's been a dick in the airplane <laughs> pulls out his uh, a portrait of his family as he's being deceased. And so you have right there his redemption or his own little tragedy. It's, he's another lonely guy in the movie. <laughs> he's married, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, all right, any other questions in the audience? Yes. Uh, I wrote this. I'm sorry. Sorry. The the question for those who can't hear was, uh, uh, what are what are the references like? The, for example, the thing or Hitchcock, and and how is that sort of uh, implemented within the writing process of the films? Well, I certainly appreciate those coming to mind. I'm a huge fan of Hitchcock, both in the way he designs films and, of course, the sort of uh, the dark and sometimes darkly satiric uh, attitude he seems to have towards human nature, which I share with him. Um, the Thing is a great film, uh, the remake, I guess, by Carpenter, uh, in that it takes place in, a, in an ice station like this. Um, so I, I don't remember setting out to reference that movie, but I was well aware of it. I always loved that film very much. Um, and oddly enough, there was a 70s movie called Ice Station Zebra, which is another movie about remoteness. And, and it just, I don't even remember the film, but I remember the trailer when I was a kid. And so, and that was such a cool name. So there's things like that. I also, especially when working with someone else, uh, Robert Lever, I, I like to 
discuss the themes of the movie. And, um, you know, I don't know if I even answered the actual question about, you know, the environmental perspective. I mean, I, f I take the um, global warming uh, very personally, and it, it seems, as I try to struggle within the film, like uh, um, you can't go home if your planet is changed. There's a great tradition in literature, you know, at the end of Gone with the Wind, she says, you know, but I have Tara, and, there's, and tomorrow is another day. Well, I sort of have this sadness about global warming such that you, tomorrow may not be another day. There isn't that ability for rebirth and restarting and redeeming yourself if, if the whole... Uh, planet that we've known uh, starts to alter and shift and become unfamiliar. So it's 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 a very deep. You talk about the sadness in the film. Well, that's the sadness I'm trying to capture: is the sense that we've betrayed uh, our Earth and our home. And it's funny. Just today, an article in the Times: America is just completely nonplussed by this issue. They couldn't be less interested. Very boring. Not engaged. Um, and I find it that in itself heartbreaking. There's a kind of hubris innate in not caring about your home, uh, your planet, that I just find uh, very motivating. So this is as much motivating me as any film reference, but of course I'm a student of film and I have horror movies are my favorite genre and so I'm certainly uh, struggling uh, to emulate uh, my favorite kind of directors. But, uh, but always I'm motivated by trying to find a truth and, and show some kindness towards the villains as well, like is another thing we've talked about. So that's, that's uh, what gets me up in the morning. Robbie, you're not here, are you? Because certainly we had a great time writing together. Um, and I get to be the boss because I pay him, so <laughs> he'll write very quickly and he writes a lot of the great characterizations, and then I go in and nitpick and try to find. It's a really nice process. Some scripts I write alone, but this is uh, very fun to write with someone. And I saw there was a hand in the back as well. Yes, all the way in the back there. Yes. So the question was about, uh, was the film shot in order of the story uh, to maintain a feeling among actors uh, as, as the film went on? Well, you know, th that's just not always practical. And on our film, we shot the exteriors first uh, in the north of Iceland, Mivaten, and then all the interior stage work was done in stages in Reykjavik and, you know, that's nice if you can do it. And actually, Larry and I did do a picture over the summer where we did that largely. But often, because of the economics involved, it's just it's not practical in any economic way. And you have to work with what you've got. You know, another thing, it's funny, I, if anybody is an actual you know, filmmaker here, there's always this idea that you want to shoot in order. It makes sense because you want to, you know, go on the journey with your characters. And also very specifically, there are things you may discover in scene three that you then can apply to scene seven and 12 and on it goes. However, I find that sometimes that is overly fetishized and that sometimes dipping into the story here and there and, and, um, and discovering the scene by scene as you go and actually leaping forward and back can have its own rewards and then when you're editing you have the experience of being on the set for three weeks applied to an early scene and that can actually be valuable so the, the pleasure and the craft is that you need to get the actors remind them where they are in the story and uh, I find that to be very stimulating and as I say I haven't always felt well look at Wendigo the movie I described well the freaking snow melted so we shot the last scene at the end and as a result it looks like crap so maybe we should have done that when we had the snow and just gone boldly to the end so uh, of course in concept you your, your job is to get the actors into the place that they're going to be um, so that's my all right, we have time for one more question. I saw another one hand up in the middle. Yes, there.
the question was uh, about how tightly the film is in concept on screen and if that was what was shot or were there other subplots or scenes that were left out on the cutting room floor? No, and it's, uh, so the answer is this is pretty much the script, this is the order of the script and these are the scenes. There was certainly, um, what I end up doing is when I'm editing, I had a film where we would lift whole scenes out and I always regretted that. I was working with an editor. In fact, after that I said I really can't that's not my process. I need to be in there massaging the material. And of course, you hope that you're taking advice from your producer and your comrades and other people. But, but still, I like to be the one that's actually doing the massaging. And what I found, I'd rather tighten a scene than, than lose a whole scene. So that just has ended up being my process. And I, I could be forgetting, but I don't think there was any other no, scenes. No, as, as I remember the script, this is very representative of what the script was. I appreciate your interpretation of the movie. I was watching it, thinking it rather, rather slow. So, <laughs> thanks for finding it tight. Uh. <laughs> well, thank you guys for joining us on stage tonight. Thanks.